Please note, this game contains disturbing subjects and imagery of violence, gore, and other disturbing themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome back to another lore video. This time, we're going to be taking a look at the story for the Japanese game called Akemitan, or the story of Akemi. It's a free game, which you can find the link to in the description below. This is the developer's first game, so please keep that in mind as you watch this video or play this game yourself. While at times a bit odd and clunky, overall this is a fun game to play and experience, and with a playtime around 2 hours, it's worth trying out yourself. Now, let's dive into the story of Akemi. We open the game playing as a young woman, Shimoko Shimoda. She walks up to a shrine where she is tasked with leaving a food offering in front of the shrine. This, we come to learn, is the home of the king. The villagers of Shimoko's village believe that a king, the guardian deity of the village, lives in the shrine and must be treated with absolute reverence. Part of this reverence is leaving daily food offerings in front of its home. Today is Shimoko's family's turn to leave an offering so they sent Shimoko to the king's home to leave the offering. There are two other very important rules to properly respect the guardian deity. Only selected people are allowed inside the king's home, and no one is supposed to touch the king's offerings once they are placed. Shimoko places the offering for the king on the table outside of the shrine and walks past the shrine, following the rules even though she doesn't seem to take them very seriously. It's then that Shimoko's stomach grumbles, and she looks over forlornly at the food offering. No one would notice if she only took one, right? The screen fades to black before we return to Shimoko, now on the trail to head home. Here she walks past Ebiko, one of her friends from the village. Shimoko and Ebiko exchange pleasantries before Shimoko heads home. Ebiko continues walking though, passing by the trail to the king's home, before she stops and turns towards the shrine hearing a child's laughter. The screen fades to black again as we return to Shimoko. Her mother is going out and she leaves Shimoko in charge of the house while she's gone. Shimoko can now explore around her very traditional Japanese home. However, Shimoko quickly decides that she's tired and she goes to her room to sleep. As Shimoko sleeps, she hears a distorted voice painfully crying out, I won't allow it, startling Shimoko and waking her up. She tries to write it off as a dream, but Shimoko is undoubtedly shaken by what has happened. Trying to comfort herself, she flips through her diary, recounting the previous few days. Most of her diary entries are very mundane, like most diaries, but on March 23rd, the final entry, Shimoko writes that she has to do the offering at the shrine the next day, which would be today. Shimoko then looks around her house for her mom, wondering if she's returned yet. When she tries to peek out the front door, Shimoko realizes the front door won't open, even though the door is unlocked. It's strange, but there definitely has to be a normal, non-supernatural explanation for it not opening, right? Shimoko jumps when she hears what I can only describe as lip-smacking sounds behind her. When Shimoko follows the sound, she finds a large, faceless clay figure. When she approaches it, it scurries away at inhuman speeds. Okay, something is definitely wrong here. As Shimoko wanders around her house, strange things begin to happen all around her. She sees the deformed face of a woman in a window, her ceiling begins leaking blood as what looks to be a body comes cracking its way out of the ceiling, the stuff of literal nightmares. Shimoko is scared and confused, and she hurries to get her phone from the laundry bin to call her mom for help, passing the clay figure as she does. Strangely though, this time it's completely still as Shimoko passes it. When Shimoko grabs her phone, she notices she missed a call from her mom. Shimoko calls her mom back, and this is what happens when her mom answers. In an alarming twist, Shimoko's mother tells Shimoko to flee the house. Something is wrong with the village and the house, but before she can say more, the call cuts out. Shimoko isn't sure what to do. 
She wants to leave the house immediately, but the front door isn't opening. Still, she's determined to find a way out. Instead, she decides to look around the house. There has to be something here she can use to help her escape the house. Shimiko goes into a room with her father's dresser inside. It's locked with padlock, but Shimiko's diary mentioned her father's birthday, and by trying the date, the lock opens. Inside is a hunting rifle, the same one Shimiko mentioned using with her father when they went hunting for deer in the mountains together. Now armed, Shimiko can confront whatever is terrorizing her and her home. I must admit, she's incredibly brave, especially for being so young. Though she doesn't have much of a choice, Shimiko still goes bravely to fight the creature. When Shimiko enters a room with blood leaking out the door, everything appears normal enough. It isn't until she moves closer to the sliding doors at the end of the room that a bloody head emerges from a pool of blood on the wall. It appears as if it's screaming in pain, its eyes shooting in two different directions as its mouth is gaping open, as if silently screaming. Shimiko shoots the creature with a hunting rifle, causing the screen to flash red before the creature disappears, leaving a black hole where it once was. Shimiko is proud of herself for defeating the creature, and rightfully so, but when she tries to leave the room, she finds the door sealed shut. She is now trapped in the room. The only way out is the black hole in the wall, but if the creature came from it, it can't be a place Shimiko wants to go. Still, to escape this room and this nightmare, Shimoko must keep going forward, so she enters the pitch black hole. When she does so, all around her is darkness. After walking for what feels like hours, Shimoko finally stumbles upon an old, beaten door. Relieved to be escaping the darkness, she opens the door and goes inside. Suddenly, Shimoko is in Ebiko's house. Shimoko isn't sure how she got here, but she's relieved anyway. Shimoko calls out for Ebiko, but receives no response. Shimako then checks Ebiko's room, finding a photo of her, Ebiko, Yuto, who's her male neighbor, and Shigemi, a girl who went missing for years ago, when they were students in junior high. Exploring downstairs, Shimako finds the place empty. Unsurprisingly, the front door won't open either. Still, strange things begin to happen around as she explores. Sliding doors open on their own, odd mannequins move around when Shimako isn't looking, and Shimako feels like there are eyes constantly watching her. While Shimiko explores, she's able to find a back scratcher, which she uses to knock down a key that was out of her reach previously. This key opens a small storage room that has a golden hammer inside. Shimiko takes it, using it to smash open a padlock on a box. Inside the box is a note that says, Dad's eye, Mom's finger, mine too. A hint to the next puzzle. Shimiko takes this note and heads back downstairs finding one of the previously locked rooms now propped open. When Shimiko goes inside, she finds a young woman inside, her back towards Shimiko. When Shimiko calls out to her, she turns around. Her appearance is horrific. She has no eyes, her mouth is leaking a black substance, and her skin is eerily pale. She runs after Shimiko, who flees the bathroom. Shimiko runs around the house, trying to avoid the evil creature as it stays right behind her. Shimiko shakes off the creature long enough to jump into a closet, losing the creature for now. Still, it's obvious that that thing will be back, so Shimiko must hurry. In the bathroom where the creature was, there is a key. Shimoko can use this key to unlock the basement. The door to the basement is locked, but a voice cries out when Shimoko tries the doorknob. It's Kyoko Issei, Ibuko's mom. Kyoko is as surprised as Shimoko to learn that she's in her home, but she tells Shimoko that something sinister is definitely happening. Something must have upset the king, the guardian deity. Once Kyoko realized something was wrong, she found herself locked in the basement. She needs Shimoko to find the key to the door and let her out. When Shimoko asks her where the key is, Kyoko makes an odd noise before falling silent. Suddenly, she says she doesn't know where the key is. Shimoko will just have to look for it. And well, yes, that does sound very suspicious. So much so that even Shimoko herself is uneasy. She doesn't have much of a choice, so off she goes to find the key. As she looks, Shimoko finds a blood trail, one that leads upstairs and into the room that was previously locked. In the room, in one spot on the wall, blood leaks out. Shimoko uses the golden hammer that she picked up earlier to smash down the wall, and inside she finds... this. Shimoko is disgusted by the deformed figure, hoping to herself that it's not real. But something feels strange about the statue. 
Shimoko has another run-in with a creature that chased her before, but this time, Shimoko manages to keep her distance and doesn't get caught. As a reward, Shimoko finds an eye. It looks just like the one the creepy statue behind the false wall was missing. If Shimoko gives a creature the eye, it will move out of her way, allowing her to get into the room. Shimoko will use its locker in her next chase sequence with a female creature to hide. In a rather moving sacrifice, the statue will momentarily block the creature's path once Shimoko passes, giving Shimoko time to run and hide. For this, it is torn to shreds, but Shimoko is saved. Strangely, the statue is bleeding red blood as it dies, suggesting it might not be just a statue after all. When Shimoko approaches it, it thanks her for giving it an eye, further suggesting that this thing was perhaps once human. Could it have been one of the residents of the house? If you remember, Shimoko found a note that mentioned a father's eye. Seeing as Ebiko's father is supposedly gone, but the statue needed an eye and bled, I think it's safe to infer that this statue was once Ebiko's father, now changed by something nefarious. But what happened to Ebiko, and how is her mother supposedly fine? Shimoko goes downstairs into the room with the traditional sliding doors. Inside, she finds someone she's never seen before. Inside, she finds someone she's never seen before. A young, red-haired woman named Akemi Hanatani. If the title is any hint, this girl is probably one that we're going to be meeting quite a bit. Still, Shimoko is so relieved to find someone normal, she disregards how odd it is for a random person to be in a cursed house. Akemi asks Shimoko if she's trapped in the house. Of course, Shimoko says yes, saying that there's also monsters everywhere now. This is when Akemi drops a bombshell. She says, Yeah, that's because this village is cursed. Akemi tries to comfort Shimoko, telling her they should stick together. It'll be safer that way. Akemi will save Shimoko. Shimoko is just relieved someone knows a way out, so she decides to let Akemi join her. They need to find a key to the basement door to let Ebiko's mom out. While they explore, they go into Ebiko's room. Here, the screen turns red as a voice calls out saying, I won't let you do as you please, Akemi. Shimoko is rightfully alarmed, but Akemi seems unconcerned. The voice then tells Shimoko to run away, to get away from her, meaning Akemi. Akemi calmly tells Shimoko to ignore the voice, just to hold her hand, but the voice screams in protest, telling Shimoko not to let Akemi touch her. Akemi is a monster. Confused on who to trust, Shimoko asks Akemi if she really is a monster. Akemi seems surprised and then disappointed. Suddenly, Shimoko is transferred to the hallway near the front door. In front of her is a bloody, limp body. They're covered in blood, but they are still alive, at least for now. The bloody person, a young woman with white hair and red eyes, manages to mumble out, I'm no good either. You be careful. Akemi is a scary monster. So this young woman, most likely a monster like Akemi, is warning Shimoko not to trust either of them, but especially not Akemi. As one last warning, the woman says, everyone will die, contradicting Akemi's earlier statement that no one was going to die. If Shimoko isn't careful, she won't make it out of here alive. Finally, the woman gives Shimoko the key to the door to the basement. Afterwards, she is silent. With nothing left to do, Shimoko goes down to the basement and unlocks the door. Instead of going inside, she calls out to Abiko's mom, telling her the door is now unlocked. When she gets no response, she enters a room. Abiko's mom, Kyoko, is inside, but she's acting strange. She begins to mumble under her breath. Shimiko finally makes out what she's saying over and over again. I'm not bad. I'm not bad. Suddenly, the door slams shut behind Shimoko, locking her in with what appears to be Abiko's mom. Finally, Kyoko turns to look at Shimoko and she looks wrong. Her eyes are wide open, her skin is pale, and her cheeks are sunken. It's as if Shimoko is looking at a corpse. But this doesn't last long because Kyoko's head separates from her body, leaving her a floating head. Shimoko has no choice. Using the golden hammer, she puts Kyoko's suffering to an end. But by doing this, Something happens to Shimoko. Shimoko's eyes turn red and she begins to chuckle, which turns into laughter, as if the horrible thing she just did was somehow amusing to her. 
However, it's obvious something is very wrong with Shimoko. Whatever happened to Kyoko must have happened to Shimoko. If she doesn't get out of here soon, she won't be leaving at all. Shimoko suddenly falls over, going unconscious. After some time passes, Shimoko wakes up. Something feels so off about her now, though, it's hard to describe in words. Shimoko leaves the basement, only to find herself back in the pitch black darkness. This time, though, as she wanders, strange shapes begin to flicker around Shimoko. Finally, she stumbles upon a door, and just like last time, she's teleported to a new location. Unfortunately, Shimoko doesn't recognize this location, so it's up to her to explore to find out where she is. However, wherever she is, it seems like a very old home. Unlike Shimoko's and Ebiko's homes, there is no modern technology or furniture. Everything looks very dated. Entering one of the rooms, Shimiko finds three people, all dead. It seems they were killed by a Japanese sword or katana. It's a cruel death, with most of the stabs being in their faces and upper bodies. There's blood everywhere, and Shimoko can hardly stand to stay in the room long. Instead, Shimoko goes upstairs, finding the picture from junior high. This time, Ebiko's face is distorted. It seems Ebiko has done something to put her right in the middle of whatever is happening. While exploring, Shimiko finds another note that says, When the king's orders are disobeyed, disaster will fall upon this village. Well, Shimiko at least knows she's still in her village, but this note is ominous. Somebody broke one of the free rules the king had. Was it Shimoko? She did consider taking one of the fruit offerings at the beginning of the game, which was against the rules. But then, how does this involve Ebiko? She's obviously involved, but how? There is only one way to calm the king once someone has broken the rules. The king demands a living sacrifice to prevent calamity befalling the village. In another room, Shimiko can find a bloody doll, somewhat similar to the one found earlier in her home. It looks ominous. Solving a puzzle in the library, Shimiko gets a key to a dresser, and when she uses the key, she gets a lighter, a video game classic. Shimiko can then use the slider in a dark room, now able to navigate it. In the room, she finds five bottles of oil, which she takes with her. Retrieving this and returning to the library will push Shimiko into a fight for her life against a bloody doll with four other identical but not bloody dolls. To survive, Shimiko has to avoid the bloodless dolls and set the bloody doll on fire with the oil she found. While this boss fight is very simple and easy, there is something highly unsettling about muscular dolls quickly and menacingly walking towards you. Once Shimiko lights the bloody doll on fire, its minions disappear one by one. The bloody doll remains burning as Shimiko leaves the room. If Shimiko goes back into the room with the corpses, she will find this clay doll that was previously in her home there, enjoying the corpses as a snack. When it notices Shimoko, it jumps down transforming into a blacked out figure, its eyes standing out as they stare blankly forward. By approaching it, Shimoko is teleported to a new area. This will begin a mini boss fight, but having seen Shimoko in action, I think she's more than capable to take on whatever they throw at her. In an amusing twist, before the fight, Shimoko can pick up four throwing knives. I'm not sure how this teenage girl is so proficient in so many weapons, but I'm not going to be the one to question her. Anyway, going forward, Shimiko enters the arena with, for the mini boss fight. At the end of the hall, she finds a woman with a katana, a red mask covering her face. This woman must have been the one that killed those men. Shimiko is horrified, realizing this woman is very strong and could very likely kill her. Shimiko runs for her life, throwing the knives with surprising accuracy to slow down the fast-moving creature. Shimiko manages to escape, going back through the blackened statue. This time, she is teleported back to a pitch black area. However, this time, there are blinking eyes, watching Shimiko as she wanders, looking for an exit. After what feels like an eternity, Shimiko finds the exit. Instead of seeing where Shimiko has gone, the perspective changes to Akemi. She enters the basement of Ebiko's home, where Shimiko killed Kyoko, Ebiko's mom. Akemi walks up to her before the screen flashes. Suddenly, Kyoko is fine and whole again. Kyoko looks around, confused about what had happened. Kyoko then turns to Akemi, saying, You are... before this perspective switches back to Shimoko. So it seems that Akemi has some sort of healing powers, and maybe she's not as bad as she first appeared. Not only did she bring Epiko's mom back to life, 
She also stopped whatever had possessed her, returning her to her true human form. Maybe she really was trying to protect Shimoko, but we won't know for sure until we keep going. This time, Shimoko is teleported to a forest. She recognizes this place. It's a road in the mountain that's near the village. Shimoko sighs in relief. She's out of the village, but it won't be that easy. It never is. Though Shimiko is in the mountain and out of the village, a black fog blocks the way off the mountain. So while Shimiko is technically out of the village, she's still trapped in the mountain. There's no escape. Instead of trying to leave the mountain, Shimiko goes the other way, passing by the shrine, the home of the king that we saw in the beginning of the game. The food Shimiko offered still sits on the table, untouched. Maybe Shimiko didn't touch the food after all, like the beginning of the game suggests. Instead, I think we can safely assume that Ebiko broke one of the king's rules, causing the curse to spread throughout the village. However, to continue forward, Shimoko must go off the road, following an overgrown path. Far up the path is a small shack. A note is inside, warning any travelers of the dark forest ahead. If they must continue through the dark forest, they need to light their way. Continuing forward, Shimoko lights her lighter. All around her are giant, eyeless red heads. They moan in pain but stay back, warded off by Shimiko's light. It seems that the note was right. If she hadn't lit her way, these heads would have certainly killed Shimiko. Going further into the forest, Shimiko follows another path, seeing another shack. This one, however, is locked. Further up the path are two clay dolls that are identical to the ones that Shimiko had run from earlier, yet this time they do nothing as Shimiko walks past them. In the next clearing, Shimiko sees the eyeless creature that was chasing her around Ebiko's house. It seems not to notice her though, continuing on the path. Shimiko doesn't want to follow the creature, but the only other way is the black fog. To continue, she must follow the creature wherever it's going. At the end of the trail, there is no creature, but there is another shack. This one holds a key. There's only one place this key must go, the locked shack. Shimiko follows her way back, going to the lock shack. Inside the shack are boxes, and Shimiko takes one with her. She returns to the first shack, using the box to lift herself high enough to grab some rope that was previously out of reach. With the rope in her possession, Shimiko can now safely let herself down a small cliff, giving her access to other parts of the mountain. As Shimiko walks to the other end of the path in the new area, she finds a cell phone. It's Ebiko's. But what is Ebiko's phone doing down here? Shimiko wonders if maybe Ebiko is somewhere nearby. Shimiko looks around, but the only thing she sees is a creature, emerging from the bushes in front of her. It shambles toward Shimiko. It looks to also crack a small smile, terrifying Shimiko who runs in fear. Shimiko runs all the way back to one of the cabins, hiding beside the door before she decides to fight the creature. This is a good opportunity. Shimiko isn't injured and she can take the creature by surprise instead of constantly running for her life. So as the creature passes the cabin, Shimiko jumps out, taking the creature by surprise as she brutally beats the creature. Once it's unconscious, Shimiko stands up, out of breath but relieved. Shimiko isn't sure if it's dead, but it's dead enough for her to escape. Shimiko looks for an exit to the forest, but now she can't find one. Eventually, she's forced to return to the place she beat the creature. Shimiko tries to carefully pass by the unconscious creature, but as she does so, it jumps up, brutally attacking Shimoko. Things don't look good for Shimoko, who begins to lose consciousness, but suddenly the creature lets her go. When Shimiko can get her wits back about her, she realizes that Kemi is there, protecting Shimiko from the creature. When Shimoko calls out to her, Akemi turns to her, saddened. Akemi asks Shimoko why she ran from her earlier, still hurt by Shimiko's actions. Shimiko isn't sure what to say to this. Shimiko isn't sure what to say to this, but Akemi interrupts her, asking her not to leave her again. She just wants to help her. Suddenly, the creature calls out to Akemi. The creature asks Akemi what she's doing here, but Akemi refuses to answer it, telling the creature to release her. It seems there is something we are missing in this conversation, a puzzle piece that we need to complete the puzzle of this story. The creature cries out, telling Akemi that Akemi is only here to stop her. It's not fair. Akemi, annoyed, steps towards the creature menacingly, and the creature steps back in response, obviously afraid of angering Akemi too much. But Akemi is sick of the creature, stepping towards it as the screen flashes. 
When the screen returns to normal, the creature is gone. In its place is Epiko, unconscious on the ground. Shimiko runs to her unconscious friend, as Akemi explains. Ebiko was turned into a monster, just like her mother. So Ebiko was a creature that was chasing Shimiko this whole time. Shimiko cries out for her friend, which seems to wake Ebiko up. And she's confused. How is she in the forest? What happened? Where did the creatures go? It seems that Ebiko is going to be okay to Shimiko's relief. And it's all thanks to Akemi. Kyoko, Ebiko's mother, calls out to Ebiko as she runs up the path with Ebiko's father. Everyone's okay. It's a big relief. Now that everyone is safe, Akemi suggests everyone return to the village together. They can't stay in the mountains forever. It's not safe. However, this plan is interrupted when Yuto, Shimiko's male friend from junior high, runs up to them, relieved to see that everyone is safe. Yuto then tells the group that everyone from the village went to the hotel in the village. Well, everyone who survived the attack from the monsters in the village. Shimiko learns that her parents are also there, seeking shelter. She desperately wants to see her family. Yuto then recommends that everyone follow him back into the village. Now, something feels off about Yuto, but everyone is so glad to know that they and everyone else is okay that they ignore these strange feelings. Ebiko is the only one to ask if the hotel is actually safe, since the village isn't. But Yuto reassures them that nothing has happened at the hotel yet, so it must be, right? Carefully, the group manages to get to the hotel without any injuries. Yuto goes to tell everyone else the group has arrived in another strange decision, but the group seems unbothered by it. Here, Shimako and the group can explore around the hotel. In an odd decision, Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy plays loudly in the background as Shimiko explores. Here, Shimako can speak to other survivors who are all very scared as well. Upstairs, Shimako finds her mom and dad. It's a bittersweet reunion that's difficult to take as seriously with the song selection loudly playing over them. Anyway, Shimiko can also speak to Ebiko's mom who is also upstairs, who, if you remember, was transformed into a monster. Interestingly, like her daughter, Kyoko says she only remembers being attacked by the monster, nothing afterwards. It gives the player some insight into the transformations. These people aren't even aware they are being turned into monsters, which explains how Ebiko could try to kill her friend, Shimoko, without any remorse. Finally, Shimoko enters an empty room, with Akemi and Ebiko sitting down to rest. Akemi warns Shimoko, though, that this place isn't safe either. She needs to be on her guard. Ebiko only wonders what is going to happen now, and who can save them. Shimoko eventually leaves them behind to find the bathroom. Going downstairs, Shimiko eventually finds it doing her business and preparing to leave when the lights suddenly go out. They remain out for a solid minute before they suddenly turn back on. Shimoko becomes worried, hurrying back to Ebiko and Akemi. They are told a meeting for all the villagers will be starting soon. For now, they just have to wait. While waiting, Shimoko asks Akemi where she's from. Shimoko and Ebiko already know all about each other. They've been friends since childhood. But no one knows Akemi. And Shimoko is right. No one does know Akemi, because she doesn't live in the village. The girls are confused. What is Akemi doing here, then, if she doesn't live here? It's here that Akemi tells them why she's here, to save them from the curse plaguing their village. Shimoko and Ebiko don't understand why, though. Why come to this village when Akemi has no connection to it? Why risk her own life for strangers? But Akemi corrects them. She doesn't live in the village now, but she used to. Akemi has a strange power, one that will protect everyone from the monsters. She already protected the village once with her powers, and she's willing to do it again. But the villagers chased Akemi out of the village the last time she protected them, seemingly afraid of her powers while also wanting her power for their own. But how is that possible? Akemi looks so young, no older than Shimoko or Ebiko. There's no way something like that could have happened while they were alive. They would definitely remember it. But Akemi disagrees. There is no way she forgot. She remembers everything, including Shimoko and Ebiko. But it seems they forgot her. Of course, Ebiko is confused. How does Akemi already know them? They just met. It seems there's even more to Akemi than we first thought. Before Ebiko can ask more questions, Yuto knocks on the door, telling them it's time for the meeting of all the villagers. Akemi has more to say, but for now, she lets it go, and they head to the meeting. 
Inside is everyone who has survived the attack on the village, including the village chief. Akemi has more to say, but for now, she lets it go, and they all head to the meeting. Inside is everyone who had survived the attack on the village, including the village chief. It's here that the village chief confirms my thought. The black fog surrounding the village has trapped them in the village. They can't leave. It's as if they've been transported to another world. If they don't find a way to fix this soon, everyone is going to die. They have to calm the king, but first... They need to know who and what angered him. There is only one way to appease the king. Find the person who angered the king and use them as a live sacrifice to the king as an apology. Only then will the horrors that have been commenced cease. Of course, the villagers are horrified and disgusted. How could they just kill someone? But the village chief assures them that there is no other solution. If they don't kill one person, everyone will die. It's here that Shimiko realizes Ebiko looks pale. She turns to her, whispering to her to see what's wrong. But we already know what's wrong. Ebiko's house foreshadowed the truth. Ebiko, faced with her coming death, faints without another word. Shimiko and Akemi carry Ebiko to a room, letting her rest until she wakes up. Akemi offers to watch over Ebiko, so Shimiko leaves. As Shimiko wanders, trying to collect her frauds and waiting for Ebiko to wake up, she notices that there is no one around. And the hallway she's been walking down for minutes hasn't ended. These hallways are not this long. What is going on? Suddenly, Shimiko hears a distorted girl's laugh, just like the one Abiko heard at the beginning of the game. The voice stops laughing and says, You can't escape. Shimiko is on alert, looking all around her for where the voice is coming from. The voice speaks again. I can't kill anymore. Shimiko grows more concerned as a white-haired girl from Ebiko's house suddenly appears in front of Shimiko. Shimiko is shocked to see her again. Shimiko thought the girl died in Ebiko's house. But the girl just chides Shimiko for being near Akemi again. How many times does she need to tell Shimiko that Akemi is a monster? She's the enemy. Akemi can't be trusted. But Akemi has proved otherwise to Shimiko. Akemi saved Shimiko's life even after Shimiko shunned her. To Shimiko, Akemi isn't a monster, but this white-haired girl certainly is. The white-haired girl grows annoyed by what Shimiko is saying, wondering to herself out loud if she should just kill Shimiko. Two red, growling dogs walk up beside the red-haired girl, snarling viciously at Shimiko. Shimiko takes a step back, afraid. The white-haired girl's eyes grow more red, telling Shimiko once again that Akemi is the enemy but if Shimiko is on Akemi's side, then Shimiko is the enemy too. She again asks herself out loud if she should kill Shimiko. It'd be so easy. The dogs could devour her whole. She ponders it for a moment before shouting at Shimiko to bow to her and apologize for her rude behavior. Shimiko refuses, telling the white-haired girl to release her dogs. Akemi will save her. This seems to infuriate the white-haired girl, who tells her demonic dogs to devour Shimiko. As the dogs approach, Shimoko cries out to Akemi, begging her to save her. The screen flashes white. Once it returns to normal, in front of Shimoko is Akemi. Beside Akemi are the two demon dogs, dead. It seems Akemi kept her word after all. Akemi turns to the white-haired girl, telling her that she won't let the white-haired girl put a hand on Shimoko. Disappear, Akemi says coldly. This seems to have an adverse effect on the white-haired girl as she screams as the screen shakes violently. As quickly as she appeared, she's gone, her demon dogs disappearing with her. Shimako thanks Akemi profusely. Yet again, Akemi has saved Shimako's life. Akemi appreciates the thanks, but they have to hurry back. Abiko is now awake. The screen flashes again, and the hallway of the hotel seems to have returned to normal. Relieved, Shimiko hurries upstairs to Ebiko's room with Akemi in tow. Shimiko is happy to see Ebiko is awake and alright, but she can tell something is wrong with her. Ebiko tries to deny it, but Shimiko pushes the issue. With everything going on, they have to be honest with each other. It's the only way they can protect each other. Ebiko still doesn't want to say what's bothering her, but Akemi tells her it's okay. Akemi understands completely. It's fine to speak up, because they are not Ebiko's enemies. 
While Akemi has a strange way of speaking, it's very apparent that she's a good person who is trying to help and protect Ebiko and Shimoko. Ebiko seems to realize this too, because she apologizes to them both, explaining that this is all her fault. She ate the offering. The game flashes back to the beginning. Shimoko looks over the offering, wondering if anyone would notice if she only took one. However, unlike last time, the scene doesn't end here. Shimoko walks closer to the offering, looking over before deciding that taking from the offering would be a horrible idea. Shimoko refuses to do it, instead quickly leaving the shrine. It's after this that Shimoko bumps into Ebiko before Shimoko hurries home. Ebiko then hears a woman's laughter, then follows the sound, approaching the shrine. It's then that Ebiko takes an offering from the shrine, but Ebiko had no idea that all this horror would result because of her actions. If she had known, she never would have done it. And while Ebiko says that, it seems that something more supernatural is at work. I don't believe Ebiko truly had a choice in eating the offering or not. She was coaxed over by the white-haired girl, the demon, and tricked into eating the fruit so that the white-haired girl could escape the confinements of the shrine. But why? Why would the white-haired girl want to do this, killing multiple innocent villagers and cursing others along the way? Ebiko sobs as she realizes the horror she's released. She's overwhelmed with grief and guilt, but she also doesn't want to die to be sacrificed to a peace king. Shimoko swears to not share with anyone what Ebiko just said, deciding to keep the secret between the three of them. Akemi agrees. If this gets out, Ebiko will undoubtedly be sacrificed to appease a king and calm its wrath. But how will they calm the king then? Someone has to die, the village chief said so. There is no other way. Calmly, Akemi offers herself as a sacrifice. She smiles when Shimiko protests, telling them that she came here to save them both, so she will do what is necessary to do so. Akemi tells them that she will die tonight. Shimoko and Ebiko both try to talk Akemi out of her plans, but she tells them that that is why she is here. It was her plan from the beginning. Shimoko is heartbroken. They just became friends. Akemi can't die so quickly, but Akemi reassures her that while she will die, they will see each other again soon. Akemi won't let anything else happen to the villagers. They are too important to her. While things were better in the past, for that woman, meaning the white-haired woman, ruined everything, but things can get better again. It's here that Akemi clarifies who the white-haired woman was. She was once Akemi's maid. Akemi shared her powers with the white-haired woman, but the white-haired woman used these powers to try and control the village. To get rid of Akemi, the white-haired woman tricked the villagers into forcing Akemi to leave the village. Then, to ensure Akemi could never return to the village, the white-haired woman erased all the villagers' memories of Akemi. To the villagers, Akemi never existed. She's just a stranger, an outsider. That would explain why the white-haired woman is so terrified of Akemi. Akemi gave her her gift, and the white-haired woman tried to erase her as thanks, so she could be the only one ruling the village. Unlike Akemi, the white-haired woman is a greedy, selfish person. But Akemi is a kind person. She still cares about the village and its villagers, so even after all these years, she has protected the village from a distance. Even after hearing all this, Apiko still doesn't want Akemi to die. She doesn't care if Akemi sees it as her duty. As Akemi's friend, she doesn't want Akemi to get hurt or die. But Ebiko also doesn't want to die either. But Akemi is determined. This is her duty. She thanks Shimoko and Ebiko for treating her so kindly. They were true friends to her, just like they were in the past before their memories were erased. As the screen fades to black, we are switched to a small room containing the village chief and the village elders. They are deep in conversation, trying to figure out who angered the king, but they are having no luck. A knock at the door alerts them, and Yuto enters. Yuto asks if they know who the culprit is, but they've had no luck. Lucky for them, then, that Yuto has an idea who it might be. Akemi. The elders seem unsure, but Yuto clarifies. Akemi isn't part of the village. Remember that they don't remember Akemi because of the white-haired woman. She would be the perfect sacrifice. No one would care if some outsider was killed. While if someone from the village was sacrificed, it would upset all the villagers. Yuto comes up with a plan. Simply accuse Akemi of eating the offering, then they can kill her without complaint from anyone. The elders agree, seeing this as the best approach. They make up evidence and set plans to frame Akemi. 
The screen fades black again before we return to the room with Akemi, Shumiko, and Ebiko. Akemi is crying, explaining that she is very sad. She asks the girls to stay with her for a while, knowing her coming fate. Time passes. Then something happens. Akemi seems concerned, leaving the room to the girls' confusion. Concerned, the girls follow Akemi, only to find her outside the room, returning stares from the village chief and the elders. They have come for Akemi. They claim she ate the food offering. She angered the king, so she will be sacrificed to the king. Shimako and Epiko try to protest, but the village elders silence them. Akemi is silent, though. She knew this was coming. She is resigned to her fate. Akemi is arrested to Shimuko and Ebiko's horror. Suddenly, Akemi has a flashback. She's in a field speaking to a small blue figure that looks somewhat like the doll Shimiko fought earlier. Akemi speaks to it, telling it that they have to leave the village. The blue figure, called Father, reluctantly agrees. It was the villagers' choice. They have no choice but to leave. Akemi is even more reluctant, though, telling her father that the village is being targeted by that woman. Akemi's previous maid, who is now the white-haired woman. If they leave, the white-haired woman will destroy the village. Akemi's father comforts her, telling her they will build a home on the outskirts of the village. Though they will physically leave, their power will stay, protecting the village. It is here that it is revealed that Akemi and her father's home that they would go on to build was the shrine, the home of the king. Not only that, they also created the concept of the king, the guardian deity of the village. The villagers would then place offerings to them as a final contract to keep Akemi and her father forever tied to the village. However, if the contract was broken, if someone broke the free rules listed, including touching or eating the food offering, then the contract would be broken and there would be nothing to save the village. So that is why the white-haired woman tricked Ebiko to eat from the food offering, like Eve and the snake, which then cast Adam and Eve out of paradise. When the white-haired woman tricked Ebiko to take a bite from the food offering, she cursed the village, putting the villagers under the control of the white-haired woman. Time then jumps forward to when Ebiko eats the food offering, breaking the contract. Akemi goes to tell her father the news. Akemi tells her father she will go to the village, knowing what will happen if she does so. Time then returns to the present. Akemi is outside of the shrine, the home of the king, with the villagers. The village chief calls out to the king, telling it Akemi is the offering to appease it, having no idea that the whole concept of the king was created by Akemi herself. In a horrific and horrible scene, Akemi is brutally beaten to death by the villagers. Shimiko and Ebiko hurry to the shrine, trying to stop them, but it's too late. With the last of her strength, Akemi calls out to her mother and father. When the villagers realize Akemi is still alive, they finish the job. Shimako and Ebiko are forced to watch, unable to stop the horrors happening in front of them. An unshakable silence falls over the crowd until one of the villagers runs up to the crowd, coming from the village. The monsters are gone, he cries. The road to the village is also cleared. The village is saved. Everyone is saved. As the villagers shout and cheer, glad the nightmare is over, Shimako and Ebiko are forced to confront the cost of their lives being saved. Akemi's life. While Shimiko and Ebiko mourn the loss of their friend, we see the fate of Yuto, the one who sold Akemi for the safety of everyone else. To put it lightly, he wasn't able to live with what he had done. We then return to Akemi, who is in a white space, covered in blood. Her father approaches, calling to her. He is devastated by the sight of his daughter. He can only imagine the pain she went through, all to save the village. Akemi has suffered enough, he decides and with his power, were suddenly put back in the front of the shrine. Ebiko and Shimiko are there, but Akemi's body is gone. It seems some time has passed since the village's curse, but Ebiko and Shimiko are still mourning the loss of their friend. Though a valiant sacrifice, it's one that both girls have a hard time accepting. They would rather have Akemi with them, alive. And, as if a wish come true, when the girls go to return to the village, Ebiko cries out, catching Shimako's attention. In front of them is Akemi. Akemi smiles, seeing the girls. But how is this possible? Akemi tells them that they wanted to see her again, so of course she came. Of course, we know that Akemi's father used his own powers to bring Akemi back to life. 
How? Well, we're not sure, and we'll probably never learn, but that's a detail I don't think needs answering. Akemi tells him that her role in the village is complete. Now she wants to return where she came from, inferring that Akemi was never human, but something akin to a deity. Shimako doesn't want Akemi to go so quickly, but Akemi promises she'll come back. And they will definitely meet again. And if the rest of the game is any indication, Akemi always keeps her promises. And that is the end of Akemi 10. So let's now break down the story and discuss who Akemi is and who the white haired girl is and how they tie into the village and the villagers. It seems that Akemi is a deity of sorts, blessed with powers from at least her father. For some reason, Akemi and her family ended up in Shimoko's village, vowing to protect them from harm like many guardian deities do. Akemi also lived among the villagers, growing close to Shimoko and Ebiko. This is my speculation, but I believe the photo Shimiko finds in Ebiko's house, the one of them from junior high, is a photo of them with Akemi. Look at the girl on the right. Doesn't she look like Akemi, but with brown hair? But that's not all. When Shimiko looks at the photo, Shimiko will mention this girl, called Shigemi, here. This girl went missing three years ago, and they haven't heard or seen her since. Nowhere else in the game is she mentioned again. This can't be a coincidence, especially since we know that Kemi went missing from the village only a few years ago. Somehow, right around that time, Akemi gave some of her powers to her maid. But why did she do this? It seems that the white-haired girl manipulated Akemi, who is very kind and seems a bit lonely, to give up some of her powers to her. Akemi did this, probably assuming this would strengthen their friendship, but the white-haired girl only did it to gain Akemi's powers. As soon as Akemi gave her some of her powers, the white-haired girl turned on Akemi. She tricked the villagers into banishing Akemi and her father out of the village and made the villagers forget all about Akemi. But Akemi loved the villagers and the village. She lived in the village and grew close to the villagers before she was banished. She wouldn't just leave and forsake them to the evil intentions of the white-haired girl. So Akemi and her father created the shrine to house their power, creating a contract with the village to protect them in exchange for food offerings. They then created the king, a deity in name only, for the village to worship. So for the white-haired girl to take Akemi's role and power, she would need to have one of the villagers break the rules. She even said it herself. She can't kill someone, but she can have someone else do it. And she had already manipulated Akemi. It wouldn't have been difficult to manipulate someone else. It seems she tried to trick Shimoko into taking the fruit, but Shimoko resisted it, leaving Ebiko to be charmed. And when Ebiko did this, it broke the metaphorical dam. Creatures flooded the village, killing indiscriminately, while anyone who could fled to the village hotel. Shimiko was also forced to face the horrors of the curse head on. And while this was happening, Akemi must have been desperately looking for Shimiko and Ebiko, her two friends. The white-haired girl knew this too, so as soon as she saw that Akemi and Shimoko reunited in Ebiko's home, she again tried to trick Shimoko into being afraid of Akemi. But it only momentarily worked. Shimiko fights the cursed version of Ebiko and her mother and is transported to the old mansion, where I assume Akemi used to live with her family, seeing as the dolls look oddly similar to Akemi's father, though corrupted by the white-haired girl. While this happens, Akemi breaks the curse on Ebiko's mother, then later Ebiko. Finally, the girls reunite, with Akemi telling them all about her past and how they knew each other previously. The white-haired girl tries one more time to trick Shimoko, but this time she won't be fooled. The white-haired girl tries to attack Shimoko, but Akemi protects Shimoko. After we learn that it was Ebiko who ate the food offering, and Ebiko will be sacrificed if the village learns about it. The girls swear to silence, but Akemi goes a step further, saying she will offer herself as a sacrifice to protect Ebiko, Shimoko, and the village. Yuto, the girl's friend from junior high, then goes and speaks to the elders, telling them to offer Akemi as a sacrifice to appease the king, since to them, she is a stranger. Who is going to care about the life of a stranger? And while everyone is horrified by the thought, no one comes to Akemi's defense except for Shimoko and Ebiko. Akemi is then arrested and later sacrificed in front of the shrine. It's here that I notice that Akemi truly becomes this Jesus-like figure, sacrificing her life to protect those around her, even though they were the ones that originally banished her. Yuto even plays the role of Judas, betraying his old friend and causing their death. Yuto even ends his life just like Judas did in the book of Matthew. 
While I'm not sure if these parallels to biblical characters are intentional, the parallels are too prevalent to be ignored, especially with Kemi being a godlike figure who takes on a human appearance, when with a father who is otherworldly, like a god. That is excluding Epico being tricked into eating the fruit offering, like Eve, who is manipulated by the snake to eat the forbidden fruit, casting her, Adam, and the rest of humanity out of eternal paradise. Akemi is even reborn by her father, going back one last time to thank Shimuko and Ebiko for the friendship before she returns home, wherever that is. And that ends the story of Akemi, but stick around because I'm going to give a quick review of the game. Overall, while I didn't love this game, I did enjoy playing Akemi-tan, though I do have a few gripes with it. For one, some areas feel a little underdeveloped. I did enjoy Ebiko's house though, every room felt like it had a purpose. I think if they created less maps and really worked with what they had, it would have been an improvement. I would have liked to see more chases or just had the creature harass us more, but many of the maps were on the smaller side, so I can imagine that would have gotten old quite fast. I love the use of multi-room mapping, so you would be in one room and could see into the other room. It was a great way to build tension and give hints on where to go next. I think my biggest gripe with the game though is the first and second halves of the game feel very disjointed. The first half is a scary curse that follows Shimako as she tries to survive. Now this half is good, I enjoyed it thoroughly. We know there's a curse, but nothing else, so it's spooky and mysterious. None of the characters can be trusted. The second half of the game focuses mostly on Kemi through minutes long cutscenes. Very little action happens once they are in the hotel. This is where the game really falls apart for me. While I like Akemi and learning about her story, I don't want to be stuck in minutes long cutscenes, literally one was like 8 minutes, which for a 2 hour game is way too long. I want to play the game, tell me the story while I'm playing and interacting with the environment. Overall, it's a bittersweet tale of Akemi trying to protect the village she loved so much. I would have loved more focus on Akemi throughout the game and not just an exposition dump at the end, but the game was fun and I enjoyed Shimoko as a protagonist. Shimoko is an unusual protagonist, but that's what made her charming to me. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel to keep up with our latest lore videos. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure to leave a comment below. Until next time, take care.